Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our DATIQ weekly market update. This is our update for February 13th, 2024. It's Mardi Gras, les les bon temps roulés. It's Punchki Day out here in the Midwest. If you're of Polish or Eastern European descent, um, the last day to get all those indulgences in before Lent, um, if you subscribe uh, to that belief system. Um, but it's a great day. Uh, here for the IQ Weekly Podcast. We've got Alex Perry sitting in for Dean Croak, who's probably somewhere over Iowa, flying back from Australia this morning. Uh, we've got Paul Brazer joining us this morning as well. Good morning. Morning. Hey, good morning. And uh, I would like to throw out, I am in Galveston, which uh, claims to have the largest and best Mardi Gras outside of New Orleans. So. Oh, really? Oh, That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Um. I'm not a huge Mardi Gras food fan because you can't get good beignets outside of, I'm sure you have them down there, but up here it's all punchki. You know, you guys know what punchkis are? No. Are those like potato cakes or something? No, they're like no. donuts, but they try to make them even more fatty and disgusting by adding like more oil and they stuff them with savory or sweet. Oh, gotcha. um, and you're supposed to eat them today because you're not going to uh, have anything over Lent. Uh, but they are like a two pounds each, and it looks like a normal jelly donut, but you could break a window with it. They are oh, wow. delicious. Oof. But yeah, you need a nap afterwards. Yeah, I need a nap after hearing the description. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a cholesterol-friendly kind of food. Uh, so, Paul, uh, can you give folks listening a brief intro of you um, and what you've been up to? Uh, yeah, I'm the uh, vice president of Dray and Intermodal Services at uh, ITS Logistics. Um, you know, for, for the past year, uh, we've been working on, you know, stabilization uh, coming out of that post-COVID congestion uh, operationally. Um, also in that Dray and Intermodal space, particularly on the ocean product, um, you know, we've we've seen a lot of right sizing of supply chains and and more normal normalizing of uh, booking. So uh, where post COVID you had tons of freight entering at uh, ports uh, primarily, uh, we're, we're seeing a lot more IPI activity, which means over the past year and a half, we've had to kind of push operations into the interior part of the United States and, and, get those operations up and running, make sure equipment's there to service uh, the freight. And, uh, you know, now uh, as, as we're going into uh, some disruption, uh, you know, on the topic that we're speaking today, uh, we're looking at bringing some of that uh, focus back, especially to LA Long Beach area, uh, on, on mothballing some facilities and, and putting some, uh, operational support in place that we had during that post-COVID congestion back in 21 and 22. That's awesome. And we actually should have a pretty meaty uh, topical thing today with CDL 1000 buying next um, uh, to bring you back on and talk about it at the end of the show. I'm sure that'll be a, a really good discussion to dive more into. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So let's get into our key points of the week. Uh, so that we can bring Paul back and have a really great discussion about some of this disruption. So let's do it. Um, there we go. Uh, so drive in and spot rates revert back to 2019 levels. I think there was a lot of debate um, whether the polar vortex was going to stick or whether the groundhog would spell uh, a return to normal seasonality. I think the last couple of weeks have settled that debate. Um, that I should have bet Craig Fuller that $5,000 um, to go to one of our favorite charities because um, the market has reverted back. Not to say that we won't recover on our normal plan this year. I just don't think that polar vortex was enough um, to bridge us between now and then uh, with over the seasonality. Uh, the drive-hand replacement contract rates are down 8.5%, reefer down 5.1%. Um, even though they're down, that is uh, continuing to slow. I would expect that to turn positive or flat sometime in the next quarter, quarter and a half. The January Logistics Managers Index from our friend Zach Rogers over there in the great state of Colorado came in at 55.6. For the first time since September of 19, every metric, metric in the LMI is reading in expansion territory. I think if you want to read into that long term, there's a lot of healthy signals around um, the end of destocking uh, and supply chains and inventory starting to right size. So that's really, really good um, for the recovery. It's just not going to help us today. 
Um, import surge 10% month over month. It's the largest sequential increase in growth for January in seven years. Um, and tomorrow, make sure that you've ordered or you plan to pick up those flowers, strawberries, and all of that great stuff um, because it is Valentine's Day. It's a busy week this year with Easter happening so early uh, with Mardi Gras and Valentine's Day and all that fun stuff. Uh, but just a friendly reminder from your friends at DAT not to end up in the doghouse tomorrow. So with that, we'll turn it over to Alex Perry this week uh, for our market update. Alex? Thanks, Ken. Uh, first off, we have the dry van uh, load to truck ratio. National spot market load post volumes plunged last week to start the first shipping week of February. Following last week's 27% week over week drop, Load post volumes decreased to the lowest in eight years. Carrier equipment posts were up 2%, resulting in last week's dry van load to truck ratio dropping by almost 30% to 1.49, the lowest since 2017. Um, moving on to reefer, reefer load post volumes continue to cool following last week's 23% week over week decline. Volumes are 53% lower than last year, impacted by lower truckloads of produce moving nationally, which were 17% lower than last year, according to the USDA. Carrier equipment posts were up slightly, resulting in last week's reefer load to truck ratio decreasing by 23% week over week to 2.39, the lowest in eight years. Flatbeds, uh, flatbed Load post volumes were the lowest in eight years following last week's 7% decrease and 55% lower than last year. Carrier equipment posts were primarily flat, resulting in last week's load to truck ratio decreasing by 8% to 6.91, the lowest flatbed load to truck ratio since 2017. Uh, now on to the market conditions. The Broader Los Angeles freight market received almost half of its typical yearly rainfall in just two days last week, impacting the movement of freight. Uh, the volume of outbound truckloads moving and load posts decreased by 5% and 9% respectively. Los Angeles outbound line haul rates also decreased down 2% to an average of $1.64 per mile. Uh, the surge in imports in January has resulted in higher load truckload volumes in port markets, including Savannah, following last month's 9% month-over-month increase in containerized imports. The volume of loads moved increased by 4% week-over-week and is now 5% higher than last year. However, with ample available capacity in the market, line haul rates continue to fall down 8% week-over-week and 13% year over year. At $1.67 a mile, outbound Georgia rates are identical to 2019, while on the short haul lane between Savannah and Atlanta, carriers were paid an average of $2.21 per mile last week, around 17 cents per mile lower than last year. Moving on to reefer, the week focus this week focuses on the southeast where the florida produce season is underway and peak shipping ahead of valentine's day occurs outbound state truckload volume was higher on the spot market last week loads moved uh increased by 28 percent week over week while line haul rates jumped by 13 percent to a dollar 46 per mile the Miami market's rates increased by 15 cents a mile to $1.44 per mile for outbound loads, while on the high volume lane to Atlanta, spot rates were the same, but around 8 cents per mile lower than last year. Avocados, tomatoes, and limes made up the top three commodities imported from Mexico last week, driving up load volumes by 16% week over week in the McAllen market. Reefer carriers were paid an average of 214 per mile for outbound loads, up 10 cents a mile after dropping for the prior three weeks. On the number one lane from, excuse me, on the number one lane to Fort Worth, McAllen carriers were paid 282 per mile, which is around 15 cents per mile lower than last year. Wrapping up flatbed. In rain-soaked Los Angeles, the volume of loads moved, dropped 17% last week, while trucks were in short supply, 
driving up line haul rates for outbound loads by 3% week over week to an average of 212 per mile. Loads from Los Angeles to Phoenix paid carriers an average of 292 per mile last week. That's the highest since July and 34 cents per mile higher than February of last year. In the Pacific Northwest, flatbed capacity was tighter last week in Medford, where line haul rates increased by 22 cents per mile to 236 per mile, following three weeks of decreasing rates. In the Southeast, in the two largest flatbed spot markets, line haul rates in Birmingham and Montgomery decreased by four cents per mile to a combined average of 216 per mile last week. Loads from Birmingham to Lakeland paid carriers an average of 261 per mile, which is almost 20 cents a mile lower than last year. Uh, dry van spot rates, the national average dry van Line haul rate dropped by five cents per mile last week, which is the largest week over week decline in a year. At a dollar sixty seven per mile, line haul rates are nine cents per mile lower than last year and just three cents per mile higher than 2019. Based on the volume of loads moved, DAT's top 50 lanes averaged a dollar ninety four per mile last week, 27 cents per mile higher than the national average. Moving on to reefer, the decline in national average reefer spot rates continues, oops, sorry, it continues to accelerate following last week's six cent per mile decrease. At $2 per mile, line haul rates have decreased by eight cents per mile in the last month and compared to last year are seven cents per mile lower. Finally, on to flatbed. Flatbed spot rates decreased for the first time this year following last week's two cents per mile decline. At $1.99 per mile, the national average is around 10 cents per mile lower than last year. And the same as in 2018, a strong year for flatbed carriers. And uh, that's it for this week's market update. Um, now over to Ken for short-term forecasts. Thank you, AP. Greatly appreciate it. Um, our forecasts, I think, got a little too into the Mardi Gras spirit um, this week because they look a bit funky. Um, so just a level set uh, for those new to the show. The blue line is history. It goes back here until August. Yeah, August 1st. Um, it is the seven-day weighted moving average long haul rate. We always start with dry van, and this excludes fuel. We've got four forecast models. Green is rate cast. That's our flagship model. Um, it's the same one, for lack of a better term. So this is what's in our actual products. They also have a red line, which is very heavily weighted towards um, short-term market conditions. And then you have a gray and a yellow, which are essentially, they're not, technically blends of the two. I know I say that almost every week, um, but they are essentially intermediate models that seek to blend um, that longer term and shorter term view. And what you see here is a lot of model confusion around what's actually happening in the market. So we had that aberrant spike with the polar vortex. We had things recede back to seasonality, um, which is essentially what Raycast has been thinking about all along um, as we move into Valentine's Day and some of that shipping that happens we see the short-term model wanting to really drag rates upwards. Ratecast isn't overly convinced. It's got a little bit of a bump and then a slowdown again, which is, again, just to reiterate, this is typically what you see this time of the year. You see little ups and downs, um, moves in the market, depending on, again, when um, holidays hit. And then things don't typically start really bumping up until we get into that produce season, which is second or third week of March. It can happen earlier some years with the wet conditions in Southern California. I don't expect that this year. Let's move to refrigerated real quick. The models are more aligned here because this is where you see a lot of Valentine's Day and just general shipping volume around this time of the year, that first wave of what I think Dean calls um, some of the salad bowl shipping and all of that um, that happens. So the models are much more in agreement, just at different levels. Again, I think Raycast here is leading the way in what it's seeing in the market. And then for some sense of normalcy and sanity, as we round out the show, we have flatbed uh, to wrap it up. Um, all the models are pretty much in agreement. Uh, Raycast has a little bit more pessimism as you get about halfway through that 35-day forecast. 
But again, those are just a few cent differences in what it's seeing in a 35 day window. So I don't think there's anything really huge here to discuss other than as we continue to see housing rebound a little bit um, and some of the manufacturing conditions. You, we talked about LMI at the beginning of the show. Um, that's what's going to put some upward pressure on these rates as well. So let's bring Paul back for our question of the week, which I will read this week because Dean is out. Um, so welcome back, Paul. So containerized imports appear to be rebalancing in favor of West Coast ports. How much of this, uh, how much of this will impact the drainage market? Well, it's going to, it's going to be a huge impact actually. And, you know, we're, for, for those that are kind of layman, we're, we're already in a peak uh, of sorts anyway. Uh, you know, the, the four weeks leading up to Lunar New Year uh, in Asia are, are a natural lift. Um, because there's so many uh, shippers uh, overseas that are closed uh, during that time period. Uh, this is a natural restock, and and it's coming on the heels of low inventories, uh, where a lot of freight wasn't brought into the United States as shippers ate through inventory in 2023. So you've got you know two things that are already kind of pushing uh, uh, volumes up across the U.S., but primarily in the West Coast, being that Lunar New Year lift and also just more volume coming back. And I think that's why you're seeing that 10% lift uh, that you alluded to earlier. Uh, in particular to L.A. and Long Beach, uh, there there is, you know, probably two large uh, uh, gorillas in the room that, that are going to impact that area for volume standpoint. And that's going to be the East Coast potential labor disruptions, right, that we're still waiting for resolution on. And coming off of some of the labor disruptions from last year, uh, people are very hesitant and they, they don't want to put themselves in a compromising position. So they're hedging to the West. And then you've got about 25 percent of freight that used to go to the U.S. East Coast via the Suez Canal, which now that that uh, Waterway is is essentially shut down. Uh, that Trans-Pacific freight that's destined for the United States is going to go into the U.S. West Coast. So there's a lot of stuff that's kind of aligning for uh, the, the U.S. West Coast, in particular L.A. Long Beach, to have a solid volume year for 2024. On the drayage side, there is a concern because rates have been very, very low. And there has been a lot of attrition in the carrier base, primarily in LA Long Beach. And because rates were so low and it kind of pushed some capacity off the market, you you have infrastructure that kind of atrophied because LA Long Beach had a terrible volume year last year. When you have all of this freight show up at that time, you know, as, as we're going into Q1, Q2, there, there is some... Uh, challenges that we're foreseeing happening in that market. And uh, we're doing the best that we can to stay ahead of it and advising our clients the same. How much, like, if we think about the next two quarters and only limit our thinking to that general time frame, so between now and the 4th of July, if things don't readily resolve themselves in the Red Sea, do you see this continuing to become more and more of an issue, or have we essentially absorbed all of the disruption that we'll see from that? Yeah, there's going to be, it, it'll be cyclical, right? Um, right now, you're, you're, you're having some natural lift because of that Lunar New Year peak, but we're also in contract season. So people are contracting ocean container volumes and choosing where they want those to flow right now. So there will be this ebb in, in the volume as it kind of comes down at the end of Q1. It's just natural. It happens regardless. So um, the, the infrastructure and capacity should do fine to, to kind of hold that. But as you get into Q2, especially the back end of Q2, that's when all your peak retail freight starts coming in. And that's where uh, there, there's going to be concern that the capacity in place now and capacity strategies that Shippers have put in place at the beginning of this year, thinking that everything's fine and it can be absorbed and there hasn't been any atrophy, could break. 
And that's what we're staying very close to is, is to make sure that as we get in the back end of Q2, Q3, that not just executing our client's freight, but what would more than likely be a significant, you know, ad hoc demand and, and, and additional requests coming in during that time can be serviced uh, fully as well. Yeah, I mean, I think as we as we look at, I think everyone's looking for what that next disruption is going to be right. I mean, we had ELDs a couple of years ago, um, some labor bumps here and there between then, and then obviously with all of COVID that happened is crazy. It's, I think everyone's looking for like what that next disruption will be, and I just don't see the Red Sea issue, given the the North American freight dynamics being that profound of a disruption to throw everything into a tailspin. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be very regional, right? Um, our concern is L.A. Long Beach uh, for, for the next couple of quarters. Uh, one thing to, to keep an eye on as well is that there's some EV mandates coming into play uh, in, the, in the state of California uh, that will start limiting capacity as well. Um, it will be in the scent uh, out the gates because it's, it's based on new registrations in 2025 right now, um, but that could be problematic and that could put additional pressure on available capacity in the state of California, which, you know, LA and Long Beach are uh, by far, you know, our, our largest uh, inbound market into the U.S. supply chain. Uh, so we mentioned at the top of the show, uh, CDL 1000 buying, um, buying next. Um, just having some view of what the SoCal trade market looks like uh, myself, I'm curious to hear from more of an expert. How do you think that's going to um, affect that market? Um, you know, I, it, that individual transaction, uh, I, I don't see it having, you know, much, if any, of an impact. I think what it does shine a light on, though, is uh, when, when you start seeing m and uh, activity, you know, is, is that being caused because rates were so low for so long and uh, there, there's certain carriers out there that that are running into cash flow problems uh, as, uh, you know, your organization calls out that operating cost uh, gets to a level where uh, long-term rates aren't sustaining operating costs. You know, is that going to drive some more of this, right? So, uh, on our end, you know, it's it, this is something similar to Convoy and and many others uh, that that we've seen uh, for the past twelve months. It, it's probably, uh, you know, given us light into some some symptomatic uh, issues on how some companies' balance sheets are looking. But um, that particular uh, transaction. It, it is just something that we're seeing a lot of that's not making the papers where we're, we're you're seeing a lot of capacity either exit or consolidate in, in markets that have been low, especially on the West Coast in 2023. What's your um, overall outlook? I mean, where do you think if, you know, if we were to have you on the show this time next year, what do you think we'll be talking about as it pertains to kind of macro import export flow? And I just, the reason I asked that question is one of the big headlines across most of the business press in the past week or two was that Mexico has now become our number one, um, in our, there are, they export, they're our number one import um, right, location. Right. So what do you think we'll be talking about this time next year as it pertains to that? Well, uh, Mexico demand is something, you know, that we actually are keeping an eye on as well. Um, you know, we're working on, uh, introducing more cross-border strategies for our clients as that demand starts to increase. You want to stay ahead of these curves, not behind them. Um, you know, on that front too, you're probably going to start seeing more vessel callings uh, from the East Coast of Mexico up into the U.S. Gulf Coast. Um, I think that is going to be uh, the inside straight for a lot of shippers. I mean, you have X amount of capacity that can get across via truckload from Mexico and the United States. And, and it's, you know, pretty static. The same with rail capacity. Um, but you're starting to see some shippers ship to and from Mexico from ports 
from the U.S. Gulf Coast, interlining IPI and utilizing, you know, uh, rail capacity to get up into the U.S. Midwest. And, and I think, you know, from a sustainability standpoint and an available capacity standpoint, uh, you're going to start seeing a lot more savvy shippers and BCOs start utilize that. Um, I think we're also, uh, depending on, you know, how the Fed uh, uh, operates as we get in the back half of the year, if you start seeing some easing on interest rates, I think that's going to make the housing situation a lot uh, uh, more robust. And you're going to start seeing consumers uh, go back to, you know, uh, durable goods, uh, home improvement, and and kind of migrating away from experience. And that, I feel like, will start lifting some volumes on the back half of this year going into, into next. Um, and and the hope is, as we get into that uh, 2025 area, you know, we've seen some normalization of rates and, and, and uh, uh, some, some leveling off uh, of, you know, kind of a bear market that we've been in for the last year and a half, two years. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, that's kind of, I think, what we're thinking about in general is that sometime towards the end of Q2, we're going to start to see things move into recovery territory, certainly not recovered. Right. Um, I think we're watching some big things. That I, the only thing I, I didn't hear you mention that I'm at the top of my list would be the, the speed limiters, if that were to really gain national traction or the driver classification as it right. pertains to um, independent contractors. Both of those things are out of my wheelhouse. I, I, I have a little bit more visibility into what speed limiters might do. Um, when, I, when people say it's not that big of a deal, I ask them to go drive their car down a parking lot at 10 miles an hour and run it into a pole and see if that's no big deal. Because that would be the average differential between right. the proposed speed limits and the proposed average <clears throat> um, passenger car. I, I heard right. that California is even thinking about doing it with passenger cars, right? Adding speed limiters. So again, I think we're even guilty of looking for what that next disruption might be. Um, yeah, and, and there's that. disruption. I think another thing that we're going to need to keep an eye on, and it's it's something we're doing a ton of right now, is investing in tech. So if you're a transportation provider and you don't have a tech stack and it's not, you know, proprietary in, in, in some form or fashion, and, and you're not bringing that to market and, and giving your clients visibility and and, and value add um, as you get into the back end of this year and and, and early next. I, I think that's going to uh, be something that will drive capacity out of the market as well. So technology and, and making that part of how you go to market and how you interface with your client is going to be a, another story. Uh, and, and it's going to have to be uh, from you know, a, a provider that that's relatively financially healthy, right? Um, you can't just be a, a pure tech company in, in this current market and expect to uh, stay afloat at, as, uh, as we navigate these challenging times in the, in the freight market. No, I think that's very, very well said. Um, Alex, anything for you as we're wrapping up on time here? No, nah, we covered quite a bit of territory in those questions so far it's been great thank you yeah i had there's one question i saw pop up from the audience um was around laredo i'm not if dean were here dean lives and breathes uh mexican cross-border traffic i don't know paul do you have any insights i know this comes up a lot we covered mexico as kind of a general trading partner yeah. but specific to laredo any insight you can offer our listeners well i i think inter interface with our clients is what draws anything that i'm doing uh with the radar and I will say that there is a ton of demand as we're going through RFP this year. Um, there, there's a lot more lanes that, that, are, that are being put on, on sheets. There's a lot more RFI activity with Mexico. Um, the, the biggest thing that, that I'm focusing on and, and we're focusing on is making sure that we have a footprint in that Laredo market uh, to stage equipment. That, that seems to be something that a lot of folks uh, have a thirst for. It's very similar to how we navigate the ports, right? You, you need a pre-pull yard so you can navigate uh, shuttling in and out of the terminals. And, and we're starting to see some demand uh, for, for something, you know, it, it seems that basic, 
but marshaling and, and tracking the in and out at that Laredo border as a lot more uh, supply chains that might not be as use to navigating there, uh, uh, start entering into that, that marketplace. So uh, that, that would be one of the, the most interesting things. And then, you know, bonded shipments and utilization of any of our assets in play, especially our, you know, million square foot DC up in, in Dallas, Fort Worth. How do we get that bonded? How do we make that, you know, accessible for cross-border freight? And, and how can we get it off of the border in Laredo and further up in the supply chain as quickly as possible? That makes a lot of sense. Um, I know just this last week, right? The customs, Mexican custom systems went down for almost 48 hours. And I know there was a massive log jam of trucks in and out because they couldn't get their uh, paperwork cleared through the custom system. They had almost, like I said, a 48 hour outage. So little mini disruptions here or there, but nothing crazy. Um, all right, we're about time. Paul, do you want to uh, give a quick rundown of how folks can get in touch with you or ITS in general uh, for all of their needs? Yeah. Um uh, first, uh, you know, the website, of course, its4logistics.com. Uh, our marketing team just uh, launched uh, a brand new uh, slick look to that. So, so check that out. Um, we also uh, produce an index that we uh, get out to, to media sources uh, every month. That'll be coming out uh, today and, and ready for distribution. You can get that on the website as well. And then uh, you can see us at TPM. We're going to have a pretty large footprint at TPM, and uh, we also will be uh, launching our visibility platform that will be included in our transportation uh, services called Container AI, and uh, it's a really slick homegrown system, and uh, we're really excited about what we think that will do to disrupt the current uh, marketplace out there in freight. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I greatly appreciate it. This was an awesome discussion. Um, I learned a lot. Um, I want to thank Alex for filling in for Dean uh, this week. Uh, we wish him safe travels back. I know he's flying into quite a snowstorm up there in New England. Um, so hopefully that doesn't add on to his travel time. Uh, any follow-up questions for us or specifically for Dean while he was out, um, askiq at dat.com is up there on the screen. His market update will be posted this week um, in typical Dean style. Um, nothing fell through the cracks. That full report was created. Dean is not a G, uh, chat GPT clone. He actually writes all of this by hand. Um, so we thank him for that. Um, hope everyone has a great Mardi Gras. Hope everyone has a great Valentine's day. We'll see you back here next Tuesday at 10 AM Eastern. Bye everyone. Bye.